Hi everyone, Doc T here with another episode of the Horses Advocate podcast. It is a gorgeous day. I'm sitting in my car. Uh, the windows are open. Uh, the sun is bright. There's not a cloud in the sky. It's just one of those typical autumn days in the Northeast um, that are belong on a postcard someplace that everybody lives up here for this and they tend to forget about the cold barren winters that they have that are, is coming up pretty soon. But as I record this, I've put in a full day's work. I've got um, a lot of horses under the belt and some ponies. Um, great, great horses to work on today. Uh, I've decided to leave the windows down. <laughs> so if you get some noises in the background, that's what's going on. Um, I'll like to let you know that I uh, heard a podcast put out by a feed company, a supplement company, that talked about colic. And it's a very interesting uh, podcast that was put on by a woman whose husband's a veterinarian, and she works for this company. And she wanted to describe what colic is, what you can do as a horse owner to help prevent it, what you can do if it does happen. And then at the very end, they put a plug in for their program that forces you to buy their product and then work with a veterinarian to make sure the veterinarian does all the things that veterinarians do to ensure the health of your horse. And if you do all that, they'll give you up to $10,000 in case your horse goes to colic surgery. They'll help uh, reimburse you for that. So it's a little bit of a plan. And it sounds great. It's not the first one that's ever come out. Succeed had one. I think they were the first to come out with their colic uh, insurance program because truly none of these companies want your horse to colic. And they're banking on the fact that if you take care of your horse and keep it healthy, then your horse won't ever have to go to colic surgery. Interestingly, the supplement company, as well as Succeed, uh, both stated the obvious that if you get your horse off grain there's a statistically improved chance that your horse will never have a sur surgical colic and i thought that was kind of interesting in addition to that podcast i did listen to cornell's um, presentation on colic they had a veterinarian uh, tate miller who works at the ruffian center which is their annex down across from belmont racetrack and he was very thorough in his looking at colic from a veterinarian's point of view. And their whole purpose was to help you as a horse owner understand what the vet is doing. He went in to great detail with very large words, uh, blood work, uh, uh, using words like abdominocentesis, which a lot of people don't even know what that is, unless you've called it a belly tap before. So it's kind of interesting how in-depth he went. And honestly, I listened to the whole thing, and I won't say that I was bored. Uh, it was intriguing to listen to his minutia of detail in how he looks at every colic case. And he had statistics behind him which really helped um, versus a guy like me who's seen so many colics. He just, I just walk up and feel and see and pretty much have a 99% chance of knowing whether it's surgical or not. And it goes right into either surgery or medical. And uh, at the very end, he basically said, that's what he does. He uh, takes all this data and his whole purpose is to decide if it's surgical or medical. They also said, if it's surgical, uh, every moment that you delay is a increased chance of death of your horse, even with surgery. Survival rate de decreases, in other words, the longer you wait. Now, I've written a lot of blogs and talked a lot about colic in the past. I thought it'd be a nice review to go over based on the uh, works of these two people, uh, the Cornell vet and the uh, supplement person. It was Platinum uh, Performance, their podcast, uh, that talked about it. And I enjoy listening to them because it gives me 
validation of what I know, but then I get, as usual, uh, two, two uh, other paths. One is frustration that we haven't really come too far. And two, not a lot of people talk about how we can prevent this because the best colic is one that doesn't occur. Just like I said last week, that the best laminitis is one that doesn't occur. Prevention is everything. So I was fascinated that both these presentations did include uh, the fact that grain, horses that are being fed grain have statistically increased chance of having a colic. And uh, they didn't say surgical versus medical, they just said colic. And I have to agree with them. I think having grain in the body upsets the microflora, which upsets the motility of the gut either making it hypermodal, at least to what we call spasmodic or gas colic, or it can actually um, cause a dysfunction of the motility, which can lead to accumulation of sand, or it can lead to the volvulus or the twisting of the gut or the uh, collapsing of itself onto itself called an intussusception. There are other causes of colic, such as um, a tear in either uh, the diaphragm, which is a muscle that separates the abdom abdominal cavity from the thoracic or lung ca uh, cavity, and the intestines slide up into the lungs. That's not a very good one, uh, but that has nothing to do with feeding programs. Um, then there's other uh, tears. Uh, there's adhesions from uh, previous surgeries and abdominal surgeries. Uh, injuries that have occurred in the abdomen that can lead to adhesions. There's all sorts of things. But you as the owner listening to this podcast, you really aren't interested in all the things that could possibly happen. I mean, there's probably about 100 or at least 50 uh, different things that if I really sat down for a while, I could push the pencil on a piece of paper and come up with all the different types of colics. But in my mind, there's always been only two types of colic, non-surgical and surgical. And it's up to you to know the difference. I think one of the best points that the gal made from Platinum was that you need to know what your horse is to know the normal. And this comes from just daily observations, from taking the temperature, learning to take the pulse, learning to take the respira respirations, learning to look at the gums by lifting the lip up and noticing what the normal color is and pressing your finger against the gums and seeing how quickly it takes for the gums to fill back up in color once it's been blanched out from pressure. And it was interesting because nobody uh, said anything about green skylights. <laughs> and I know that green skylights can really affect the look of the gums. Um, some of us have barns with the metal roofs and then they have up there this green skylight and it, it, it changes the color of the gums. So never look at the gums at night under uh, artificial light because it'll give you a false sense. You have to really get to know what your horse's gums look like in all conditions. What does it look like under the green skylights? What does it look like with a bulb? Um, you know, just a incandescent bulb or fluorescent bulbs or from the light from your phone. Maybe you just want to use that just so you get a good basis because you can adjust the brightness of that. I don't know if you can adjust the colors of it, but a full spectrum is what you really need to see. And of course, sunlight is the best. So none of them mentioned it. I'm mentioning it here. If you want to learn about gum color, because it should be pretty pink. Uh, take a look at your horse anytime. It should be pink. Um, if you press your thumb or finger up against the gum, it will blanch to white and then the capillaries, which are the small blood vessels, will refu uh, refill or reperfuse is the fancy word uh, with blood. And that usually takes, um, it's almost instant. Uh, they'd said two seconds, that's pretty slow, but it should be like 1,001 and it's pretty much all filled up again. If they're sick, if they're in shock, you press it, and it'll stay white for two to three to four seconds. And that's not good. In addition, the gums won't look pink, they'll look dark red. And the dark, darker the red, the more toxic shock that they have. Sometimes you look at them and they're pale. And if you've ever known somebody who's gotten sick suddenly and they're um, in a lot of pain, they can also get pale gums. But 
honestly, you're going to know your horse is in a lot of pain without having to look at the gums. I love the heart rate. You should practice the heart rate every day until you figure it out how to do it. Uh, you can feel it with your hand. If you press it uh, flat up against the horse's chest underneath the left armpit of the horse. So you stick your hand right underneath the elbow of the horse and you press it up against the chest and then relax. Hopefully the horse is relaxed. If it's not, it's going to grind its elbow into the back of your hand. That hurts. But you can sometimes feel the lub dub, lub dub, you know, the beating of the heart there. Uh, sometimes you can look at the jugular groove, which is in that lower portion of the neck where a vet might give an IV shot. Um, and you can sometimes see the pulsing going on there in a very normal, calm horse. Just remember that if your horse is normal, it's about 40 beats per second. And that's so much slower than humans. If you're used to having a stethoscope, you want to stick the stethoscope right near that left elbow, right on the chest of the horse, and just listen and move it around till you, till you start to hear it go lub-dub, lub-dub. It's kind of cool. Um, you could even stick your head down there and press your ear up against it, but my head's too big, so that doesn't work. Um, and of course, you feel for peripheral pulses down on the legs or underneath the jaw. And that just takes time and patience. You should ask your veterinarian to show you how to do that. They can take the time to help you guide and, and hold your hand, literally hold your hand, so you can feel how much pressure you put on. You don't want to put a lot of pressure because you'll just block the vessel off. But if it's just lightly feeling right underneath the jaw, you can feel the pulse. Or just like on a human, you can press your fingers lightly on your wrist just above where your um, forearm meets your thumb. I can, I can feel my pulse very easily right now. Um, and it's going more than 40 a second, uh, 40 a minute, but that's okay. I'm a human. That's good. Um, one of the things that you want to look for is a heart rate of 60. Now they didn't mention this and maybe it's just me. I don't know. But when you have a heart rate that's 60 or more greater than 60, that usually indicates a horse is in a lot of pain. And those are most certainly uh, worthy of going to a hospital for uh, further workup. Um, I like to take a horse that's got a heart rate of higher than 60 and just put them on the trailer and send them to the university or your surgery suite because there's a good chance that they're surgical colic. I've always used that as a rule of thumb. And what's really easy, really, really easy, is once you can feel the pulse or listen to the pulse of the stethoscope and you're just counting, if you're getting one beat per second, that's 60 beats per minute. So it's really easy. So if you're looking at your watch and you count out five seconds and you hear five or six beats, you know you got a problem. So rule of thumb, 60 beats per minute. Above that, it's probably surgical. I may be wrong, but I'd rather have you there and then be wrong, then have you home, and it's still and I was right, and then your horse's chance of survival just decreases that rapidly. Um, pain. This is one of those things where I talk about threshold of pain when I talk about dentistry, but it applies to everything in life. So if the horse is um, very tough, a tough guy, stoic they may not show a lot of pain. They just may be depressed and you know that they're not interested in eating grain or hay. They're sitting there with the head down, standing there, might be laying down. They might be slowly looking at their side uh, versus the one that just can't stand up anymore. It's thrashing, it's kicking, uh, it's just excruciatingly painful. One of the things that I want you to memorize, and this is one of those truisms, the degree of pain does not equal the severity of the colic. I've seen horses throw themselves down, horrible sweating, just so painful. And then you listen to the, um, you, you check the heart rate and it's like 40. And now how can that be? This horse is in violent pain. And yet check the heart rate, it's like 40, 45, 50. 
you give them a dose of antispasmodic uh, medications. I personally like Banamine. And the horse is out of pain instantly. And then you have the other one that's just standing there, not doing anything, just kind of looking really dull. And you check the heart rate and it's 65. And you take it to surgery and it's got a twisted bowel. So the degree of pain does not equal the severity of the colic. That's one thing you must remember. So heart rate is 60. The degree of pain does not equal the severity of the colic. There's a couple other things I'm going to teach you as well. I have picked up something that has been well known for a while, but it's nice to hear it from the vet from Cornell. But I love Banamine as an anti-inflammatory for colic. It seems to work really, really well. And I always have given it IV. It's just what I do. It has labeled for use to go in the inner, in the muscle. But I'd say in the past five years anyway, everyone's talking about the reactions that some horses are having to intramuscular banamine. And the vet here said, look, if you don't remember anything from this lecture that we're giving, remember this, never inject banamine in the muscle because you can kill the horse or it's just a horrible problem. So I'm going to go along with that. Never put it in, in the muscle, even though it's labeled for muscular use. You only want to put it in the vein. Uh, same for butazolidin. If you have injectable bute, it should not be in your hands. It's a dangerous drug. Um, give it back to your veterinarian. It can only go in IV. You stick that in the muscle and you'll slough the side of the neck off. It's just disgusting. But there, the same thing is happening with some banamine now. What he did say was you can draw up your injectable banamine, take the needle off the syringe, and squirt the dose inside the horse's mouth. And as long as it's touching the mucosa, which are the gums or the inside of the lip or underneath the tongue or wherever, it will get absorbed and have just about the same effect as injecting an IV. And I thought that was fascinating to pass along. He really... Uh, emphasize that. He also said, if you have banamine paste, you can use that orally. It's interesting because a lot of horses that are sick, if they have uh, something wrong in their small intestine, they may have a lot of reflux. So I'm not really keen on giving anything uh, orally, but if they have reflux and their small bowel is uh, compromised, then all the food and juices are coming back up the esophagus. It's a surgical colic anyway. So you need to get the horse going. And I probably would st stick with injectable banamine given either IV or squirt in the mouth. Here's another uh, one of my uh, rules of thumb. And that is if you do give an anti-inflammatory, I again, prefer banamine. Some people like dipyrone uh, and there's others out there. But banamine has been the a true and tried way of doing it. I also add xylazine and rompum. But if you give medication and in one hour that horse is colicking again, like it seemed to help for maybe an hour and then he's back to colicking, it's surgical. If after four hours it comes back painful, it's most likely surgical. Sometimes that's wrong, but more times than not, it's surgical. Uh, the veterinarian said these drugs should go 12 hours. They should have an effect for 12 hours. I don't want to disagree with him, but I do know that when it comes to colic, if you're, re if you're giving another dose of banamine in four hours, there's something that needs to be pursued. He's got an impaction or he's got a blockage someplace and he's either at best just needs a lot of fluids or at worst needs to have the belly opened up and the problem removed. So pain unresponsive painkillers is one of those key things. So a heart rate that's above 60 or pain that's unresponsive to painkillers are two major uh, criteria for separating colics from a medical, meaning you give one dose of banamine and the horse usually corrects himself and everything's fine, and a surgical, which means you're giving another dose of banamine and that's not good. I think those are the biggest take-home messages about colic that I want you to understand. Uh, but again, prevention is the best thing. And there are so many ways that you can prevent this with 
not feeding grain being the primary one. The problem with feeding grain is you're also feeding the gut bacteria. And when you feed them the wrong foods, these bacteria can alter the composition. What I like to call it is there's a town. Imagine you live in this beautiful town. Everybody gets along. There's no crime. Everything's great. And then one day some guy sets up a crack house and they're cooking meth. And when that happens, you know, we all get concerned, but for some reason it's ignored and, and life goes on. But then two, three, four crack houses open up and now we've got a really big problem. And if the sheriff is a coward because um, the grain keeps coming in and it's changing the microflora, so they doesn't have a chance to fight to combat these crime scenes, um, then things get worse. And that's when peristalsis or the movement of the gut gets altered and the gut starts to shut down or starts to do some crazy things or gets um, burning sensations, these ulcerations. All this stuff occurs that makes a horse just feel like crap. And it can show as unwilling partner, uh, inability to ride effectively. In other words, the horse starts to buck or um, give you fits, doesn't like to be girthed, you know, put the girth on, you tighten it up and they swish their tail. They don't like to be groomed. These are all signs of ulcerations and just an inflammation in the gut that you have to get rid of because that can lead down the line to uh, enough stress, like getting on a trailer, going for a ride, uh, being bullied by some other horses in the paddock, being uh, bullied by a bad groom or a trainer, and they're just they're just miserable, and these guys can become um, get colic when you add up all the things. Um, it's funny, there's some music playing. Everyone's got their windows down, and it's really loud, and it's kind of distracting me. Um, it's just, just a glorious day here. Sorry to digress, but it's just beautiful. Green leaves and blue sky. And I know in another week, it's just going to be no leaves and rain and cold and miserable. So we're just going to enjoy this a little bit longer. Um, okay, stress. Um, if you start to change the gut flora, so it comes back to what belongs in that area. The crack houses are uh, dismantled. The bad guys are booted out. Uh, the village comes back to normalcy and everything flows well. That's what we want for our horses. It's one of the reasons why I advocate for removing um, the excess sugar of grain and the inflammatory things of grain and grain byproducts and all the crap that we feed to our horses under the guise that it's actually going to help them. But there's no proof of that. And I've got a whole nother uh, episode I want to uh, talk about about feeding and nutrition and where all the science came from and how false most of the science is. And that's just uh, crazy. That one's just, I'm, I'm gonna bring some notes to really combat your belief systems that if somebody says that this supplement works, you need to start asking, says who? You know, show me the data. And most of the data that comes out is biased and it's uh, subjective. And that's just not the way we need science to be. And you walk on, you just go onto any of the social media platforms and you'll have a dozen people say, I think this thing or that thing is the best thing for a horse because it does work. Well, it just doesn't work that way. Horses are so individual in their makeup and character, just like you and I are, that uh, what's good for one is not good for the other. But we do know that if we honor the horse uh, and feed it the way it should be fed, the way it's evolved over you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years, then <laughs> now we've got a train going behind me. <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't hear any of this. I'm hearing it all. And I'm like, okay, stay focused. Okay, y'all can laugh now, okay? Because I know you're not listening to me because you get distracted too. So uh, it goes both ways, gang. Anyway, um, we have to understand that most of the things that we hear uh, are usually because somebody's trying to sell you something. And that, of course, they want you to buy their thing because it's the latest and greatest and the best. But when it comes to colic, uh, the less you feed a horse um, and it, these foreign substances, and the more you feed it the way it was uh, intended, 
the less chance you're going to have a colic, and that's the bottom line. So just to have a quick review here, uh, learn to know what normal is in your horse. Get your stethoscope out. Get your fingers and your hand to learn how to palpate for that uh, heart rate. Uh, watch the respiratory rate. Respiratory rate is about 12 in a horse. If the horse is huffing and puffing, it's in pain. Um, if um, you can look at the gums, you can, if they're tacky and dry, uh, they're going to some shock. Uh, that's not good. They should be pink. They should be moist. They should have a capillary refill time of about a second if they're really healthy. Some people look at hydration status, and to me, that's always been confusing. Uh, you got a fat horse, you got a skinny horse, you got a horse in training, you got a horse that's, you know, doing nothing. Uh, it could be winter, it could be summer. Um, that seems so subjective. The only true way to find out the hydration status is to take a blood sample, and that will tell you if they're hydrated or not. And rule of thumb is they're usually dehydrated and fluids usually help. Uh, when a horse is not feeling well, they'll stop drinking. And of course, they drink a lot of water uh, in a day. And if you're not, uh, if they're not drinking, they're going to become dehydrated, especially if it's in a cooler time. Speaking of which, um, one of the reasons I wanted to get this thing out on colic is I found that in the Northeast when I was practicing uh, uh, emergency medical you know, care. I would find that the November rains in New York, and it could be a different month for you guys, but it's when it really starts to turn cold and the rains come and there's no real shelter and it's about 33 degrees, you know, which is one degree above freezing in Fahrenheit, or if it's just a smidge above zero in Celsius and the rain isn't turning to ice, but it's just cold and miserable and the wind and uh, there's the shorter daylight so it's getting dark sooner and the leaves have fallen the phone would just start ringing off the hook and almost every time it was an impaction because they just stopped drinking because i mean i worked all day and i barely drank a liter of water whereas in florida when i'm working i'll drink three or four liters you know the goal is half your weight in fluid ounces. So if you're, let's say, um, a you know, 150 pounds or 200 pounds, if you're 200 pounds, you should be getting at least 100 fluid ounces uh, in your in your body. And a horse, it's virtually the same, and uh, eight pounds to gallon. So um, gallon is 120 fluid ounces. So that's a lot of water uh, to a horse. Anyway. Um, Gosh, this is so distracting. The music and guys, it's just maybe I shouldn't do these things in my, in my car anymore. Um, but it's just such a great opportunity because I have all this time. Um, so make sure they're hydrated. Here's a, here's a really good point. If you really want to get your horse hydrated well, um, heat the water. When the seasons change and it starts to get cool, heat the water. Horses in a cold environment love warm water. We had a stock tank in our farm in upstate New York. And in there, in the stock tank, we put an iron boot. Um, it was made of steel. And inside that steel boot, it looked just like a boot, but it was kind of, you wouldn't want to wear this. It's a funky boot. But inside that boot was a flame. And that flame was attached to a gas tank that was sitting outside the paddock. And just like uh, a hot water tank in your house, as it hit a certain temperature, that flame would come on and it would heat the water in that tank. And on those really cold days, you could actually see the, the vapor rising off the tank. And those horses would go through a tank, and I mean a big stock tank of water. There'd be like four horses out there. We'd have to be filling it every day. They sucked down so much water, it was mind-blowing. If you want your horse to make it through the cold of winter, especially during that transition of autumn, make sure your water is heated and that you have plenty of it. I don't care if you do it with electricity or if you had a gas powered um, flame inside a boot, inside the water, whatever you need to do, get it heated. I know a lot of people like, um, they like um, 
just to let it uh, freeze and they chop the ice off the top and the horse sticks its muzzle in and it starts drinking this very cold water. I know it's possible, but if you really want to help them out, make sure they're drinking a lot of water, you should heat it. I think that, I think uh, making sure your horses don't have any parasites because those parasites are going to hunker down during the, uh, the cold of winter, the decreasing daylight causes a lot of parasites to become insisted inside and they're waiting for the increasing daylight to start to m migrate through the body and come out. And it's a great time to get in there and see if you can get rid of these parasites before they make their insistent stage. Um, so parasite control, uh, water, try to make sure there's no stress on your farm. Um, if you're working your horse hard, make sure you're feeding them plenty of good food and not a lot of sugar because the sugar is just going to add infl inflammation that's going to compound issues in the gut. I hate colic. I really do. I, you know, I would get called out in February when you had a change of season. You have a high pressure system and a low pressure system and everything would just start uh, changing uh, in the seasons. And all of a sudden the phone would start reading, uh, ringing. Uh, green grass would be sprouting in February because it'd be warm and there'd be rain and it would get this, this change in, in pasture and all of a sudden the horses, it just boom, 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 one colic after another. Um, going back to examining your horse, if it's very quiet in your barn and you just listen and you hear a lot of gurgling, that actually is a better indicator um, of a medical colic than it is of surgical. Usually when a, um, the bowel twists or becomes obstructed, gut motility shuts down to almost zero. So you don't, you don't hear any gut motility. Now you can use a stethoscope or you can put your ear up against the side around their belly in front of their stifle, uh, high up near the hip and all the way down as low as you can get and you listen. And if you hear a lot of gurgling, that's good. You should take a normal horse and learn to listen to what normal sounds are. But if you start listening and there's no sound at all, that's, that's an indication that you got a problem. Another is a gas pocket. Now this is kind of difficult for a lot of you to learn how to do, but I know that you can take your finger and what we call flick your finger on the um, side of the horse and it sends out a shock wave that goes all the way across this gas filled bow and bounces off. So it's like a pinging sound, like you hear the submarines, you know, when they've got sonar going ping, 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 um, you can hear that. So uh, that's one of the things that you can uh, learn to listen for. The more you listen to your horses and understand what normal is, the more you're gonna be able to pick up on these colics. But I know there's a lot of people out here who don't listen, they just, they just don't know their horse. They, they barely see it for like three minutes out of the day when they throw food at it. And then they come back and, you know, a day later and they do it again. And in that time, a lot of these horses go downhill and get sick pretty fast. The sooner you recognize a horse has colic and start acting on it, the better off you are. Uh, the sooner you call your veterinarian to help you, the better off you are. There was a discussion on whether you should uh, medicate your horse for colic uh, before you call the vet. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, the veterinarian at Cornell said, I have no problem you giving a dose of banamine and seeing if that helps your horse. Um, whereas the other vet um, at Cornell, the host was saying, yeah, well, from a practical point of view, there's veterinarians who don't like that happening because <laughs> The, um, the vet doesn't want to be, you know, you have a colic at four in the afternoon and you give it banamine and you wait and then eight or nine o'clock at night, you call the vet and the vet wants to go to bed, you know, but you've decided to wait to eight or nine o'clock before the vet comes out and they come out, but it's not as fun as catching it sooner. So that's just something for you to think about. Uh, that's between you and your vet to discuss. Um, I know in my practice, if they wanted to try some banamine and see if it's okay, um, I thought that was in the best interest of the horse. Um, and in the pocketbook, a lot of people don't have a lot of money to, to call the vet out every time there's something wrong. So now they're stuck between saving some money and 
getting their vet a little pissed off at them. So use your judgment and put yourself in the shoes of the veterinarian. If you're noticing your colic at six o'clock at night and you give banamine, and then four hours later at 10 o'clock at night, he's starting to colic again, you know, your vet may get upset with you saying you should have called me sooner. We could have had this thing wrapped up in the horse and at the surgery where it belonged. And that's something that you and your vet really have to go over. Um, that's not for me to tell you. It's a debate for you and your vet to discuss and have an honest conversation. Say, look, I can't afford having you come out here for my 10 horses, to which maybe you shouldn't have 10 horses, but that's a whole different sto story. Um, you just need to understand that veterinarians are humans too, and they have wants and needs and desires, and they get exhausted. And what happens if they're coming out there at midnight for you for the colic that could have been out there at six in the, in the evening uh, and they get in a car wreck and um, they are go to the hospital? Um, where does that, you know, how do you feel at that point? So uh, weigh it both ways and, and be kind and discuss it. I think it's each vet is different and um, that would be a good conversation to have. So I think that just about wraps up everything I want to say about colic, uh, heart rate above 60, um, pain unresponsive, painkillers um, are the two big ones that you need to take away. Uh, from a veterinarian point of view, if you have an abnorm abnormal rectal exam, uh, that's usually surgical. Uh, but you guys aren't going to do rectals. I wouldn't advocate uh, that you do. I think uh, somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, sticking their arm up the rectum of a horse is dangerous to you, dangerous to the horse, and doesn't prove anything because it takes years and years of practicing before you get really good at rectals. Um, and if you don't know the spleen uh, from the large bowel, from the pelvic flexor, from the uh, kidney, um, you, you have no right being inside a horse, so don't even bother doing it. Okay, let's tell you a story. I wrote this story uh, as a blog, and um, it's called She's Going Down, just to give you an idea of how bad a, a colic can be. There was a um, barn that was about 45, 50 minutes driving from me. Uh, they called me one Saturday afternoon and said, just want to know if you're you know, at the end of the phone, Doc. There's um, a horse that just seems a little iffy. They've been riding it, but there's just something off and we don't know whether we need to call you. So I thought that was pretty respectful for me um, and it proved that we had a really good working relationship. He gave me the information he had, which I trusted him. And he said, I just want to watch it, but I'll put you on alert. So just before he hung up, in the background, I heard someone shout, she's going down. And, and there was a pause and then the farm manager said, gosh, the horse just crumpled and fell down. I said, I'm on my way. So I flew down there, um, got there pretty quick. And when I did, they were walking the horse around in the arena. They said, Doc, if we don't move this horse, she just goes down and rolls. I said, all right. So I didn't do the heart rate. I didn't do anything. There's no doubt in my mind that this horse was uh, in stress. So I put a sleeve on and while the horse was walking, I walked with her and did my rectal exam. And there's no doubt we had gas distended large bowel and it wasn't in its normal place that the anatomy is all messed up. So I had an abnormal rectal. And um, every time we stopped the horse, she would just crumple and fall in pain. So I instructed them to get their two horse trailer take the middle partition out and hook the thing up and get the horse ready to load up to, on the trailer. In the meantime, I called the answering service. This is right outside of Cornell. And I got Sue, who is the answering service lady. I, I said, Sue, you need to call over and tell Cornell that we're coming in with a colic. It's a surgical colic. Um, and um, there's no need for a workup beforehand. I will have the horse anesthetized when we come in and we can drag her off the trailer and do surgery on her. And God bless Dr. Ducharme because he trusted me 
And um, I hung up and I said, I'm not going to be able to hear back from you because this is before we all had cell phones. Um, I placed a jugular in this horse and got the horse um, onto the trailer and I immediately uh, administered the medication that anesthetized the horse and she laid down quietly in the back of the trailer. I said, okay, close the gate, here we go. And I pointed to this gal, she was a New York State trooper. And I said, you're in charge of taking my truck up to Cornell. Um, and I stayed in the back and it was about a 50 minute drive with you know no traffic because it's at night. And the gal who's driving did a great job and she uh, she flew up there and about 15 minutes outside of Cornell, the horse started to come out of the anesthesia, the injectable anesthesia. So I had my second doses ready and I gave them and out she went. And uh, we got to Cornell, it was so funny. Uh, the state trooper is driving my pickup truck, you know, with a vet unit in it, um, got pulled over by a state trooper for speeding. <laughs> <laughs> and she got out of that ticket <laughs> and um and then uh we got to the cornell and the only way we could get the trailer to the uh surgery suite was to back it down what's what they called back then the finger barns they don't exist anymore if they do it's just different um but because i used to drive semis for a living yes a lot of you didn't know that i used to drive 18 wheelers got me through vet school uh, I now went from veterinarian to truck driver and I got in and I was able to back that trailer with a few inches on either side of it down the long uh, laneway right into the surgical suite. And then they, um, we opened the gate and a bunch of us just dragged this full size uh, warm blood mare out of the back and onto a dolly, uh, a, a wheeled table and wheeled it in, prepped her. And Dr. Ducharme said, do you want to um, scrub in? I said, absolutely. We got this horse in the table and under the knife and its bowel um, opened up literally less than three hours from the time I got the phone call. Um, so it was about two and a half hours uh, from the time where they shouted, she's going down to this horse is transported to Cornell and its guts were opened up. And she had a 540 degree volvulus. So if you're not good with geometry, um, 180 is, means it's flipped, you know, halfway over. And a 360 degree is a complete turn, a whole revolution. And 540 is one and a half turns. Uh, so it was absolutely just tied up in knots. And Dr. Ducharme untangled it and the bowel pinked up. In other words, the blood reperfused and we felt like the bowel was going to be healthy. And uh, we, we didn't uh, resect any bowel and sutured everything up. And the horse recovered and we were really pretty excited. I mean, this horse looked really good at you know 12 hours after uh, surgery. And at 24 hours, was still looking good. But by 36 hours, uh, the toxic shock came in because they didn't know anything about how the gut bacteria, when it's lack when it lacks perfusion and then suddenly gets reperfused all those bacteria in there died and created shock and um and killed the horse and um she ended up dying but the whole point of the story is time is of the essence and there are times when even time that quick amount of time between she was in a lesson she comes back into the barn she feels sick she goes down, we get a diagnosis, we transport, and we open her up less than three hours. Um, and it still wasn't fast enough for this particular horse. Time is of the essence. We can't stress that enough. Um, and that was just one of those times where it's just like crazy. Um, on the flip side, I've had a lot of horses that uh, no doubt has, a, has some sort of large distended bowel uh, it's got a heart rate above 60. It's unresponsive to painkillers. And the people say, I can't afford surgery. There's just no way. Um, I give them the option. I give them some pretty good painkillers. Then I put them on a trailer 
and I say, I don't want you to drive like a madman, but try and find some rough roads. Make that trailer do a little bit of bouncing. And I'd say, I maybe I could be off here, but 25%, somewhere between 25 and 50% of the horses that were surgical uh, come off that trailer and they're fixed. Their bowel is just untwisted and everything starts working again. So don't underestimate uh, the power of the trailer ride. I've sent many horses to Cornell that were definitely uh, surgical, but when they came off, they said, you got any hay here? I'm kind of hungry and never looked back. And I warn people that that can happen. And usually people are pretty happy about that kind of uh, response. So I get them, um, so I give the credit of just tossing themselves up and down. Uh, a relatively new type of colic has occurred called the nephrosplenic ligament entrapment. When I say new, it was new when I was still practicing because one of the first cases uh, that Cornell had ever seen it had just been um, talked about in a paper I think out of Europe someplace, and they decided that they would um, drop the horse and try to roll it before they decided to do surgery, and it actually worked. Uh, later on, they discovered that if they gave a drug that shrunk up the spleen, uh, it would really help to uh, untangle the guts that it flipped up and gotten caught on this ligament that uh, connects the spleen uh, to the kidney. I had a couple of those out in practice and I did the rolling technique out in the field and uh, had the horse survive. So that's kind of cool. If your vet knows what they're looking for and can diagnose that, you could do a, a, a chance of rolling it, especially if surgery is not an option. The horse is too old or um, there's just not enough funds. Uh, there are some things that we can do out there that might be able to help you if it's a nephrosplenic ligament entrapment. Um, and there's other some secrets. The older the vet is, the more tricks they have up their sleeve uh, that they can help you with. But the only thing that is tried and true is time is not your friend. Uh, the more time you accumulate between observing a horse has colic and getting a uh, treatment for it, uh, the greater chance that the horse can become surgical from a non-surgical and that um, the survivability decreases. So that's about it for colic that I got here. Um, that's just from my own experiences. It was nice to hear these people uh, make their talks about colic. Um, I'm not trying to make you guys veterinarians. And for those of you who do become veterinarians, there's a whole list of things you go through from blood work um, to physical diagnosis, uh, even radiography to see if there's uh, sand or enteroliths uh, to get an accurate diagnosis. And a lot of times the accurate diagnosis isn't made until you open up the abdomen and you pull out the intestines and you start to see the problem. Uh, the secret is, as a horse owner, know what normal is and know when normal isn't there and then make a decision. Also plan ahead. Say, look, I've got, you know, a dozen horses. Uh, I'll do surgery on these three and the other nine, uh, sorry, but that's just never going to happen. And make sure everybody understands that and you make an agreement. I think that really, really helps in case something does happen from a broken leg to a surgical colic. Um, it helps that you've made the decision while drinking your Chardonnay at the uh, dinner table and, and all calm is upon you. Um, the other is make sure you have a health savings account for your horse. You know, put in five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. Get yourself a credit card that's got, you know, $10,000, $15,000 limit and say, this is my colic card. I never use it. It's there for emergencies only. And then deal with how you're going to pay that off over the years after the surgery. Try to get a good working relationship with your veterinarian. Understand when it's okay to give medications. Uh, before he gets there, he or she, um, or whether they don't want that, uh, then say to your vet, well, are you always going to be here? Well, I only work five days a week and two days a week. We have doctor, you know, whatever over here is covering for emergencies. Well, then talk to that other veterinarian, find out what their uh, rationale is. There's uh, a lot of benefit opening up dialogues with your veterinarian and discussing things. Um, you are the owner, you're the caretaker for the horse, you're the advocate for the horse, and you have to make these decisions before um, 
crunch time. You know, when it's, you know, midnight and you hear the banging out in the barn, you go out there and you see that your horse that was happy and healthy at eight o'clock night check is now uh, down rolling and kicking and, and uh, obviously in abdominal pain. You have to know which vet you're going to call, whether they're going to come and take care of you, what kind of client are you? Are you the type of client where the vet sees your phone number and they roll their eyes and like, no, I'm not going to answer that? Uh, are they the one who's going to pick? Yeah, that does happen. Or you're going to be the one who says, oh, I trust uh, this owner. The vet has a lot of faith that you don't make uh, willy-nilly calls that they can trust you as being a great observer of your horse. I think that goes a long way. Remember, veterinarians are nothing more than people who have a degree. And you have to treat them as the way you'd want to be treated. Uh, neither one of the pre presenters said anything about that. And as far as the... Um, Colic insurance goes. If you want to do that, that's fine. I just think it's wrong that you're held hostage. Um, you want the $10,000 benefit, and yet you're forced to subscribe to something that may or may not really be beneficial. Uh, there's other avenues that you can take to make sure that your horse remains healthy. Uh, you're forced into using your veterinarian uh, for everything. Uh, and I know as an equine uh, dentist, uh, veterinarian, um, sometimes I'm excluded from that. It has to be the veterinarian who does the colic analysis that has to do the dentistry. So you don't have that option of, of choosing who you want to take care of um, for your horse's teeth. So it's, it's, it's frustrating. I think there's, there are better ways to get this coverage um, just get some surgical insurance um, and forget these uh, wheeling, dealing um, programs that are out there. Uh, that's just my opinion. Uh, it's a free country. You can get whoever you want to take care of your horse. But again, you want to have a really good relationship with a vet who's going to show up, not with your equine dentist. Uh, and a lot of people understand that. And so they, they will use their veterinarian, um, local veterinarian, to do everything. Uh, from the wellness exam, the fecal exam, all that stuff. Um, and I guess that's the option. And again, it all depends on the vet that's in your area. All right. Well, I spent enough time. That's about 50, 55 minutes uh, talking about horses and colic. And it's everything I know. I don't have anything else. The brain is empty. Uh, I'm just so enjoying this uh, day. I hope uh, the weather where you are when you're listening to this is beautiful and I hope you also are taking the time to get over to the Horses Advocate and uh, become a member. Your support uh, does help, um, and your support does not have to be becoming a member. Um, I, I absolutely appreciate everyone who does, but your support can also be by telling other people about this podcast, helping other people learn that there are other ways to look at things that are involved with horses. I know that I've got a couple, uh, a couple things in my mind that I want to do coming up. Uh, I want to get back to this three-dimensional communication. Uh, I'm going to have part two, maybe even part three coming up, uh, where I take the anatomy of the brain, of the human brain, and extrapolate it over the horse's brain and my experience with horses and communicating with them and help us all become better communicators with our horses. I want to... Um, redo the nutrition course. I want to redo the horse. I want to make a horsemanship course. I want to redo uh, the dentistry course. Uh, there's so many things I've got up my sleeve and I'm trying to do that and get these podcasts out and uh, drive around the country and take care of a horse's teeth. And uh, the holiday seasons are coming up and there's just a lot to do. But the good news is uh, Mac just released their new uh, MacBook Pro and my dead and dying MacBook Pro um, might get re replaced and that should help me um, get a lot of these things going. So I'm going to say goodbye to y'all. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining. And please uh, tell other people about the podcast. Go to the, your favorite podcast uh, media, whether it's Apple or uh, Google or Amazon or um, Spotify or whatever. And go in there and leave a five-star rating. Let people know that this is the place to become an advocate for your horse. That's that's the cost of admission to this podcast. Um, I don't have any advertisers. I don't subject you into um, buying certain things. I just want you to become uh, 
an advocate for your horse and whether you do it, become a member or just telling other people about it, I'm always grateful. All right. So thanks, Doc T. I'm going to sign off and uh, I think I'm going to enjoy this weather a little bit longer. All right. Bye. Hey everyone, Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe, comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review? However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also going to help others find me. And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Doc T out.